Welcome to our Ask Me Anything panel discussion for the AI and HCI course at CHI this year. So I'm really happy to have our distinguished panelists here today. I'm Dan Russell, uh, the sort of moderator for this, but we also have Vera Liao from Microsoft, Elena Glassman from Harvard, Shin Mike Lucarni from Emory, and, and Nick Mar Marcellaro from CMU, right? Okay, so we've got a set of questions that you, the student population sent in to us. And so I basically sorted through them, cleaned them up a little bit, uh, not for language, but for clarity and concision. And the first one that question I want to ask everybody is what research finding or insight has surprised you the most at this intersection of HCI and AI? What would you say? Let's start with you, Vera. What, what, and then we'll go to Elena. Sure. So I work in, I work a lot in this area of human AI decision making. There has been a lot of uh, experimental study looking at how it impacts decision making when we introduce AI. Uh, one surprising finding is just how hard or how rare we can reach this human AI complementarity, meaning that this human AI joint decision is better than human or AI alone. So there are many different reasons I'm not getting into, but two things might be worth um, sharing insights. One is that that tells us when we are developing AI technology, we are not having in mind this optimizing for human AI complementarity, right? We should think about what human is good for, what human is not good for, and then think about what is AI assistance should be providing. And the second is uh, we also need to rethink what even this complementarity means, right? A lot of study kind of over focusing on this question of how do we improve performance? But there are different costs and benefits people consider when we are choosing to work sure. with AI. So how do we broaden this view of, is it just performance? Is the efficiency? What are different benefits people want to gain from, mm -hmm. from AI? Right, how about, how about you, Elena? You raise your hand, what would you say? What's most surprising to you? Um, well, so I've been thinking not so much in the realm, I've not spent as much time as you've been uh, in, human um, and AI assisted decision making, but more in kind of like um, AI assisted composition of programming uh, or programs, right? You know, language in programming languages or natural language. And in that context, um, the, um, the most surprising thing that I should just say two surprising things. The, the first one would be that uh, giving people, if they're not sure, giving them the a much more complicated interface that allows them to say like, well, I think this or, or that or or this other thing. Right now they've got like they've they've spawned multiple possible futures that the AI is trying to create for them. And you would think, you know, I I, I thought this is a terrible interface. It's gonna crash and burn. And instead, the pre the, the the I mean the, the graduate students who were leading us were were vindicated. You're right that my pessimism was wrong and they and and the system um the participants preferred having basically the the non-punishing parallel worlds that they could just you know they could leave a parallel world they didn't like as much um and we were able to you know uh, using parallel threads not really um penalize them for how many parallel threads they had or or changing their mind um and so so uh, that that would be the most surprising thing. The second most surprising thing is much easier to say very quickly, which is just that the cost of integrating any suggestion from an AI is extraordinarily heavy. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect that. I expected you to say it was going to be very easy, but all of a sudden, it's a good twist. Okay, Chinmay, what would you say? Uh, okay, so people have said many uh, smart things already. Too. So to add, I think there's two things. One is. I'm surprised by how well uh, large models are able to understand unarticulated needs from users. Mm. So even if you say things like, make this text less awkward, and less awkward is a very underspecified construct, but it does seem to communicate to at least a fine-tuned and RL-trained uh, model that you know, less awkward usually means these sorts of things. So, so that has been really surprising to me that there are these human constructs which are unarticulated or sometimes very tacit in communication, which we are able to pick up on the hints of uh, with large models. So yes, that's one. 
And I guess at a meta level, I'm surprised by how little HCI AI research there is, right? At the true intersection of these fields. Uh, so I think that a lot of the research that I have seen uh, is at the at, at, at sort of the surface of this intersection, right? Like you take an AI model and take its outputs as they are, rather than changing the model to reflect better human intents, for instance. So I think- Very good, more. very good. Thank you. Uh, Nick, what would you say? What's the most surprising thing to you? Yeah, I think one of the most surprising results that I've seen is, so in the context that I work, which is understanding how designers and engineers, experts work with, AI system is is that how the introduction of AI and AI results from things can actually make those experts dumber. Um, that they actually mm -hmm. can can cause people to to not actually to basically lose skill effectively because they then lean on the computer. And, and that's a result that we've seen before in other contexts. I've seen it in the context of mechanical engineering design. Um, problems. Uh, actually, my friend Chris McComb here at CMU has a study on this. Um, but it's and then I've actually seen this happen to people in my own work, and I it it keeps surprising me. I guess it keeps surprising me that even experts somehow, when provided with AI systems, um, seem to lose some of their expertise and, and ability to reason. Um, and that that's something that's a little bit troubling to me, but also maybe sparks an interesting area of future interaction research in this domain. I, I think we're going to come back to AI and, and social expectations. Um, but it's interesting, uh, lead line there, uh, AI makes people lose their critical reasoning skills. So I, I guess I would say, if I was to answer this question, I would say that the big thing that surprised me the most, and I've been working in this field for, oh man, uh, uh, so shall we say decades, four decades? I've been, uh, I got my PhD in AI in 82, 83. Um, it's the rapidity with which everything is changing. The landscape of AI has gone through more change in, I would say, the past year, year and a half than I'd seen in the previous two decades. Uh, it's not that people are, you know, uh, working harder, it's just that there was a huge surprise, I think when the, the large models, the foundational models came online, all of a sudden things were possible, like what Chinmay had just said, and effects like, you know, uh, Vera was talking about the capabilities and so on. We have immense capability, immense power. So that's a fascinating, fascinating development that all of a sudden everybody's a chat GPT expert. <laughs> so we're all prompt engineers now. And that that did not happen the first couple AI times, right? Nobody became an expert systems builder, you know, relatively speaking, not like this. Not like this. So this is fantastic. Um, so let me ask, you know, uh, uh, maybe I'll ask Vera this. What are some of the key differences when you're designing for AI systems as opposed to designing for traditional UIs? Let's yeah. start with if anybody else has a comment. Sure. Vera, that's, a, that's a very good and difficult question. I feel like whenever you give a talk on HAI, human set AI, you're almost guaranteed to get a question like that. I don't have a complete answer, but I, I can share my process of thinking about this, right? I think whenever we have a new technology, it's useful to think about difference in three aspects. One is the materialistic property, how that different? And also, um, what are the new requirements for the design process, which can be due to the material, can also be something just emerging because where the industry it is right now. There has been a lot of HCI study recently also looking at how practitioner work. Um, and lastly is also what are the technology specific issues, uh, what are the patterns of issue, which my, my part of a uh, tutorial actually covers a lot in terms of what are the potential harms. A lot of them emerge from fairness related issues I will not cover today. Um, but I, I, I'm also interested in like other panelists think about this material difference. I feel one good place to start is this Chen Yang's paper that I'm paraphrasing. Uh, what it is, how is AI uniquely difficult to design? Right? And, and she point out, uh, so I'm gonna make an assumption when we say AI here is not one particular model, it's this broad sets of different kinds of model, right? Two things, one is this um, capability uncertainty because you have these different kinds of model because the model are still learning, are still evolving. 
And the second is this output complexity, which a case in point is this generative model. There's so, so many different outputs and different user prompt different way, you get different output. That makes things like prototyping really difficult. You have just to have to work with the model itself. Right. Uh, but there's another point I want to point out is also this non-deterministic of material, right? If you're a designer, traditionally you have a material, you understand what it is, then you work with it. But with AI, you are um, you have these all different models to choose. You can change the parameter, you can change the threshold. So that forces you to doing this design space exploration and shaping the material at the same time. And that also impact the design process. For example, ideally, you want the designers and data scientists to work together and give rise to how do they collaborate? How do we have new design process? Those kind of questions. So that's good. Okay. Yeah, no, that, that's excellent. So one of the threads of the discussion that came up through the, the questions people submitted was the sort of pragmatics of this. And you touched on this a little bit, Vera. Um, but let me ask Nick this question. How important are programming skills for the prototyping and developing of AI interfaces? And Elena, I think you might have some thoughts about this too, but let me start with Nick. What do you think, Nick? Yeah, so I, I'll say that my views have changed maybe in the last couple of months. Um, before, oh. I would say that I think programming skills were pretty important. If you were thinking about de developing um, functional interfaces that you wanted to test with people, like you needed to be able to build those interfaces and or you needed to have a team that was willing to work with you. However, I've worked with a lot of teams in the past and um, on the HCI side, sometimes it's hard to get maybe an AI engineer, machine learning engineer to, to want to work with you, to want to develop a feature. They may have a, another thing that they're interested in. Um, and so I personally, from a student perspective, I, I was very much a, a proponent of people learning a program at least enough. Also because things had been getting easier and easier, right? More systems were becoming open source, more um, code was actually being written in languages like Python, which are a little more easily approachable. However, my mindset is changing a little bit these days just because, um, at least with language-based systems um, and LLMs and things, actually you can prototype a lot of stuff effectively with language alone. And thus, while I think you may need to think a little bit computationally, um, and I still think computational thinking is useful, I'm not sure you may need to program. Actually, there, Andre Karpathy actually had a tweet, at, I don't know, in the last like couple of days, which was like, the hottest new programming language is English. Um, and so I'm starting to change my thoughts on that. That being said, I still think that computational thinking and programming, programmatic thinking is likely still useful here because they still are programmed systems and that, that breakdown of tasks is probably useful. Bef very quickly, now when it comes to um, designing interfaces, I'm not sure you need to do as much of pro, uh, pro, uh, programming, as much as I think you need to have a focus on interaction and you need to be able to build interactive prototypes, things that actually change and move and that kind of stuff, but you could potentially do that without programming. Elena, I'm curious so, what your thoughts are. Yeah. yeah, no, I was just gonna say, so one of the threads here is uh, we're all prompt engineers now, right? We're all trying to figure out how we can make the magic incantation so the foundational model will act in the right way. Is it, do you agree with that, Elena? Or I have not yet become a prompt engineer. <clears throat> I see more and more people around me. You will. Uh, you will. <laughs> I I have put on my calendar to spend some time with GPT four um, uh, to see if it can do some automation of code that I would have otherwise had to write myself in JavaScript, right? That would have been kind of annoying. Um, I think that um, for a lot of the things that I'm thinking about, I, it, I still feel like the context is so specific. Like, let's just say you're designing a visualization. Um, if you, you know, like there are things like, you know, things that uh, qualities of our visual perception that are extraordinarily expensive to simulate and very quick to check, like glance at it. Oh, yeah, that's clearer, right? And it's not clear to me yet that <clears throat> uh, these large multimodal uh, models have um, the data or would ever have the data to kind of, um, uh simulate 
uh, or, you know, to evaluate things in the way that my brain can evaluate things. So I'm still, you know, yes, maybe I will become a prompt engineer, but there's just, there's just these, there's things for which their data exists, which I can expect the large language model to get better and better at, you know, synthesizing for me. And there are ways, uh, there are tasks with, I think there's a hard boundary that, that, that data doesn't exist. And it's not going to exist anytime soon. So understanding right. that band boundary is where I'm at. Got it. So, so the, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a question next, Jimmy, <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, I, I mean, continuing the same thread here. Uh, one of the questions we got uh, were, what are some of the best practices to identify or define key features for a particular context or model? So it's continuing this, you know, thread of how do people build systems? What would you say? What are some of the best practices to do that? Okay, so now you're asking me a slightly different question, but yes. I'm going to try and fit my original answer to this question, <laughs> and then recompute an answer. Uh, but okay, so so there's two things here. One is I I think maybe this is a contrarian bet, but I think that uh, having been I guess a prompt engineer for a while now, I see a lot of programming per se becoming unnecessary really uh, for many, many tasks. So if you want to build a visualization, uh, you can get pretty far just using a prompt to get to a code that you can try out in a browser. And when you get to an error in the browser, you can paste that error into the input to your model. And then the model will say, oh, yeah, I forgot this thing. Let me fix that. right? And then you can go and do things much faster. So I think that the programming part of it, to me, sounds to be a little less important over time. Uh, and especially because you only have to do it once. You don't care about inference costs for these models, because you just take the static code and you paste it somewhere. You only have to compute it once. Um, but I do think that. Thinking about uh, what aspects are important, the things that I think are going to remain important are composing these simpler tasks into systems that are actually useful. So the visualization by itself is not going to be everything that the system does, but composing that into a user experience that matters. So I would say things like architecting of these larger systems where prompts are a small part of it. I think engineering practices as to how do I make these systems, prototypes, reliable, useful, and usable, I think those would be uh, important. Um, there's this part of me which I'm, I'm trying to separate out in my mind whether you use the model as a runtime assistant or whether you use it as a compile time assistant. And I think that the two cases lead to different use cases. Sorry. Yeah. I, I, you know, I'm with you. One of the things that really surprised me was the first time I asked, I think it was chat GP3 to uh, write some JavaScript and it produced not 100% correct, but mostly correct JavaScript. It floored me. It was, I didn't, I never, somehow I never thought of that as language. And I didn't think the model we trained on that, but you know, there's amazing things to learn. Um, I do want to continue this thread here a little bit about building larger and larger AI systems. And so one of the questions we got, I want you to hand this to Vera, is how do we produce frameworks that are applicable to a large number of different situations um, in the sense of, does every new setting require a new AI rulebook, or can we build one and adapt it to different specific cases? So now I realize I might have misunderstood the original question because yeah. the term AI Roblox book have many different interpretations, but I'm going to try to answer because I was also thinking about in terms of design framework, right? So maybe there's a shared question useful is a, what is a good characterization or useful characterization of a situation? Um, so the key question here is really what's the good level of abstraction Right. When you are thinking about what is different kinds of use case, right, you can think, oh, these are what decision support, but also under decision support, there may be AI help you discover new knowledge or AI as a delegate to perform the task. So there are always are different level of abstraction, how you determine the right level of abstraction. That's that's a very much context dependent question determine de depending on the kind of goal, the kind of technology you're looking at. Uh, but I also think 
in HCI research, there are useful research insight in terms of how we develop design framework, what is the right framework. One paper, I'm going blank on the name of the author, the title is Designing for Interaction, Not Interface. So what is a good uh, a calculation of interaction, right? And then the author uh, laid out three things that it should have good descriptive um, power that cover this design space well. Um, and then evaluative power that distinguish different points in the problem space and also generative power, which is uh, help you to explore uh, new points in the in this kind of uh, problem space. I think it's a very abstract answer. I hope it's somewhat relevant to, to the original question. Yeah, so uh, one more question about this, this issue about prototyping, because clearly people want to know, how do I build these things? So uh, let's go back to Nick and ask you this question. Um, how do you start prototyping user interfaces, incorporating AI? Tell us something about what programming languages, APIs, should we use Canva or Unity 3D? Um, it sounded like earlier like you were saying, well, maybe not. Maybe we could do it all with just English or just you know your natural language. What would you recommend to this, this questionnaire? Yeah, well, first off, I think I would recommend, it depends on one, what kind of AI you're thinking about using. I think one of the things is that in our conversation, and this is just because just as so everyone on, everyone knows who's watching, right? Like, chat gpt you know llms they're they're having a moment right now and so i think a, a lot of my mind is around this i mean I'm, I'm currently looking into this but i have to remind myself that you know last year i was just so excited about foundational you know image uh ob object detection models and um, image segmentation models working with those for the most part was you downloaded some code from uh github repo you it was in python and honestly i could run it on a ra i started start running it on a raspberry pi um and you know a tiny little computer and that's actually what i was teaching my students last year this year now we're trying to think okay well what do these language models do so in regards to i think getting started in prototyping the first thing is i think if you're interested in the interaction design and i, I really really like vera what you were talking about there not not just the interface but the interaction and the interplay between the ai and a person i think you can do a lot of that with a sketchbook and I think you can do a lot of that with things like our tried and true methods like paper prototyping or developing interfaces in digital tools, say like you know Canva or Figma. Interestingly enough, actually, one of the things I found is that some of our digital tools don't allow us to prototype mixed initiative interfaces particularly well because we don't have the ability to control them, or at least I think their features aren't there. Whereas actually with paper prototypes, like it was easy for me to you know, stick things in front of people and take things away and make things automatically show up. And so I would say that those are definitely ways to get started. Um, I think if you do have some programming skills, uh, then it's worth trying to play with developing um, some form of automation into uh, your, you know, building off of frameworks that you may already know how to use. Um, if that's where, for example, like if you're a Unity developer, Unity has lots of features that allow you to do that. They've got toolboxes. And I think you can start building cool interfaces there if you happen to be doing web development then I think you can start to build things in um, to those. So I think it really depends, but I would argue that if you are, if you're coming from a background where you're, you're a designer, you're not particularly a developer, you can utilize some of our tried and true methods to start thinking, but thinking though in a more mindset of mixed initiative user interfaces and thinking about things that are automatically changing, that are, that are, that are moving in different ways than just pure direct manipulation. Very good. So Lena, let me toss this this next one to you. Um, how is human interaction with AI, and you know, whatever, different from human interaction with other modes of computation? Is there a difference, or is it kind of all it, it's all elephants all the way down? Uh, sorry, just to make sure I understand the question correctly. So it's like, is human AI interaction distinctly different than human computer interaction? Yes. Uh, where there... the computer is not doing inference. Yeah, I think that a lot of um, a lot of the cognitive tasks that are non-trivial for the user are the same uh, in a sense, um, uh, except with this big addition just of the computer doing inference in the case of AI, right? Where um, there's a lot of extra uncertainty that introduces in terms of um, in terms of the human understanding what the computer is or isn't capable of 
right? That may not be uh, immediately clear um, or um, uh, <clears throat> yeah, other than, I think that the, the questions that remain the same, right? Is like, uh, you know, what is my system doing? What is the data that I'm acting it to act on? What is the situation if it's embodied? You know, what are the, the environments I'm acting it to act, uh, asking it to act in? Um, uh, you know, the, the integration cost of taking in the results of that execution or that rollout of that, you know, say robotic policy, all of those things are still there, regardless of whether you programmed it yourself or you said in natural language in the, you know, the new lingua franca of programming, uh, what you wanted and a large language model uh, spit out a program for you. So I, I think there's, right. there's so much that's still um, relevant here um, that we need to think about explicitly to help people uh, regardless of the back end. Thanks. And Jinmei, you've got a comment on this. What would you say? Yeah, so, okay, so I think that uh, both to this and the previous question, I, I think that there is a key difference in how AI interacts. And so I feel like a lot of the times automation has power over interactions between people. So uh, on an NSF project, I was working uh, with this union of uh, house cleaners and other hospitality workers. And we have an AI system which does shift scheduling, which tells them which rooms to clean and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that system has power over the workday. Uh, uh, at Google, there is a system which books meeting rooms for you, and that system has power over me whether or not I get a meeting room. Uh, in one case, the power is a lot, it manifests very differently. For me, it's an inconvenience. For someone else, it may be a lot of work stress. Um, the problem with AI, I think, is that it has power, but because of its non deterministic nature, you cannot really say all the ways in which it will influence you. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that changes the stakes for the design of the system quite a bit. Right. Uh, right. And sort of connecting it to the previous question um, with prototyping of AI, I think that there is great potential with uh, advances in modeling techniques, but there is also great potential for harm with mediocre AI. <laughs> which is death by a thousand cuts, right? And yeah. so I, uh, I I feel like there, uh, how do you prototype with AI is a question that assumes that you know what you want your ends to be. Uh, and I think a lot of the times the question is, what should our ends be? So I, I, I think it's sort of a dual process thing where you want to say, let's actually find out what is it that is helpful in this con uh, community or context. That's part one. And as designers or engineers, just play with the design material to see what its potential and possibilities are. And I think both have to be decoupled. Right? We yep. can't do this uh, necessarily saying we are going to do this in context. Uh, right. we, we might, yeah. No, that's, that's a great point. Um, as we've already pointed out earlier in this conversation, not all AI is a large language model or a foundational model. There are other applications of AI. And so you just made me think that one of the things that, you know, building off of what you and Elena had just said, there are different kinds of systems one can build. So for example, lots of games have AI components to them. And this introduces that sense of non-determinism. And it's not a language model, it's it's a different kind of AI, right? And so, for example, non-player characters in a massive online game often add all kinds of interesting complexity and color and character to a game. But I don't know how you test that. I mean, my friends in the gaming world just sit and run these things forever and ever and discover that, for example, that all the NPCs, all these non-player characters end up in one part of the maze. And in, in, the more general point is, as we start to develop these larger AI systems that are composed of multiple pieces, some of which are non-deterministic or give you multiple options, like Elena was saying, I we have an interesting issue about how we're going to test and validate these systems. But uh, I want to go go on to another question that came up multiple times in the questionnaire we handed out to people, which was, 
about people's attitudes about AI. And the question was framed as what stereotypes and prejudices do people have about AI and why? Can you comment on that? So let me ask Nick about that. You've been thinking about this. Yeah, what? so whenever I think about, you know, just stereotypes or what, what are people going to be thinking about these things, I almost always go back to Reeves and Nass and the media equation and just the fact that people, they treat system, they treat media, computational systems are media uh, socially. And so we can sort of leverage a lot of our understanding about how people interact and treat thing, people socially um, as a way to think about how they're going to, to treat AI. The other thing but, too but is like- Let me pause you real quick, Nick, because I think you said something really profound there and I don't want it to slip away. So the media equation is that book by Nass and Reeves, right? And the tenet of it is people cannot help themselves but deal with computers or any sophisticated technology in as kind of a social way. Is, it, can you say one sentence more about how that relates to AI systems that we're seeing now? Yeah, so I mean, I think that it means that people are going to treat these uh, in a social manner and, and basically they're, gonna, they're going to anthropomorphize them, whether we like it or not. Um, this is the thing we see over and over and over is that no matter what you try to do, if you try to make something a tool, um, people will treat it in an anthropomorphic way in some form or another. The question is, is how, to what degree? And that was that was something that, I mean, I've been all, always interested in is, is like, where does the media equation almost, you know, where's the limit? You know, how far into the social interaction? The thing now is that the way in which we design our interactions with these things, I think also mediates more or less how, how socially we will treat it. So for example, we had, GPT and we had pretty decent APIs for it for a while and chat GPT didn't change I think a lot of the back end I mean there were some improvements but I think it was the chat interface and then all of a sudden everybody now is like whoa I could use this and I can treat this in a different way but partly they're going to treat it as if it's this social entity like it's a it's a, a person that I can then talk to um, and so I think that's that's one of the things that I almost always feel like no matter what you're building, that's something you should keep in mind is people treating things socially and anthropomorphizing them to some degree. Right. Right. So I think uh, you had said earlier that um, the chat interface or the AI interface oftentimes will make people less critical of these things. And I absolutely see that all the time in my work. It's a real problem. Elena, you've got a comment on this. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, I'm in a I guess a spirited argument, perhaps uh, a um, uh, an, a collegial disagreement uh, with a uh, with a colleague of mine. I I, he, I don't know if he's ready to kind of make public his his arguments. So I'll, I'll um, but you know, there's there's um, one could treat this more anthropomorphically, okay, and and be like you know this talk to it like an intern and a, a pretty intelligent intern. Um, you'll, if you do that, you will get better results out. And, you know, that is part of, that is, that is the, the requirement. I'm hearing prompt engineering. Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> no, 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 no. This, this is a different issue. Oh, okay. okay. So, so you, um, alternatively, right. Um, I, I, so basically you can treat it like a human or you can say, look, this system is, uh, if we treat it like a human, um, that its inputs and outputs are, especially outputs, are limited to human abilities as well. We're, we're you know, we are kind of both over anthropomorphizing it, as well as limiting ourselves to the much wider world of outputs that these things can have, because we're making them look, behave like a human, which both I think can make us maybe um, trust them potentially inappropriately in some sort of social context, but more importantly, there's other ways to render the output that maybe more complicated than a single chat response, but would actually provide more value to the user. And also might break this magic of, oh my God, like there's a, there's a, there's a spirit in the machine, you know, that is trying to convince me that my, that it has knowledge of my marriage, that my marriage isn't good and, and actually it's in love with me to reference one particularly uh, dystopian uh, conversation a reporter had with an early version of uh, Bing's chat client. That was the Kevin Roos New York Times article, yeah. Okay, well, 
Uh, let me let me shift the, the conversation a little bit more. We've been sort of increasingly making it more and more practical, and let me get all the way to pragmatics of actually works groups working together. And so let me ask Vera a question here: How should or how can HCI people, software engineering and AI people, work together? Do you have some recommendations about how people can do that? Uh, I'm going to start with not how should, but how are people doing. Okay. I'm also hesitating to say something just based on my personal experience, but I'm thinking recently there has been many study on uh, practitioners, how UX practitioners working together with data scientists. I think there are lots of parallel in terms of how AI and HCI research work together. Um, so there are two types of common, relatively common process. Most commonly is this kind of model first. You have a model developed and then you bring in a UX person and then trying to create some kind of interface. And then we also start seeing UX first because in practice, a lot of times that's because you already have a product and you're thinking about adding AI to somewhere that maybe you have a UX practitioner that's already in the space. They know the user problem and they're trying to, um, for example, getting involved to choose which model is the right model. But very rarely, maybe more ideal, but people don't do enough is to have more intertwined process, right? Coming back to this exploration of design process and uh, shaping material together, maybe mm -hmm. a more ideal process is you understand the user needs that shapes some decision, for example, model choice. But as you go down this design space, for example, how do you set parameter? How do you choose the threshold? Those can be informed by another round of uh, UX research. So I think this, there's a lot of parallel in terms of HCI and AI people, how currently working together, right? Um, I A lot of my work is in this explainability interpretability field, which is very much an interdisciplinary area right now. You see a lot of this algorithm first. You have a fancy new interpretability algorithm that HCI people are trying to build interface, trying to study interaction. Uh, you start seeing some research not HCI per se, but for example, social science, uh, telling you these are the fundamental property people want from explanation. These are different ways people explain. And we're starting seeing inspiration of new algorithms developed that way. But I think we haven't really figured out a good way to have more intertwined process, right? How do we get a user needs in the first step of defining the feature? How do we get into the evaluation? How do we think about this AI research pipeline? I think that's uh, still very much open space that needs more more effort. Good. Chinmei, you've got a, a comment on this. Yeah, I think I have a shorter, short uh, take on this, which is HCI and AI people should work together with humility. Uh, and I, I think that I see this happening quite a bit where uh, there is all kinds of boundary issues, right? So there's vocabulary questions, there's mental models which are different across people who uh, try to do algorithmic work versus people-oriented work. Uh, there is all sorts of power dynamics as well. Uh, and it's not clear who's on top all the time, right? Uh, it depends on the context. Uh, but I think that there is, I, I don't think that this is a situation where uh, one can lead. Uh, and so I think that we need to work with humility. Uh, there is a third stakeholder, which, or rather third decision maker, which is not included in here, which is the people who pay the bills. Uh, and I think that I, that is the elephant in the room. I, <laughs> that's not the question, but I think that that's an important question to think about. Like, what are the commercial concerns around this collaboration? That, that I think is a, a, a really uh, useful point to remember, actually, because without without the computons running in the background, none of this happens. Um, but one of the things I, I'm hearing from both of you is that interdisciplinary activities are sort of core and fundamental to all of this. And we've always sort of said that in HCI. HCI is fundamentally a kind of interdisciplinary field. Um, but now, in my experience, I've, you know, for example, set in on groups that are producing explanations, and I, as the representative of, of humanity, come in and say, "I'm sorry, that's not really an explanation." Right? No human can understand that other than you, PhD with mathematics from Harvard. Right? That kind of thing. 
Um, so I do think that humility is a great approach. Interdisciplinarity is going to be absolutely key to making a lot of this stuff work. Um, let me let me sort of wrap up, and I think this is our last question. So I want everybody to comment on this, uh, which is, what's your prediction for where the most interesting, exciting research is going to be in the next year? And if you've got a two-year prediction, go for it. And if you give a five-year prediction, I'm not going to believe you, <laughs> because two years ago I would have not have predicted this course at Kai this year. So what would you say? Let me just go around and ask people sort of, you know, one at a time. What's your prediction for most exciting research topic next year? Nick, go. Probably next year, it's gonna be around generative systems and the way people interact with them. I mean, this year we already have seen a number of publications at Kai coming out around this. So I imagine we're gonna see more. I think the thing that's gonna be exciting is probably more in, in defining what are really great interactions um, and maybe potentially new interfaces for these. We've been seeing a lot of work in that space, and I think we're going to see more. The main thing here that I'm I'm interested in seeing is things that will have a little more staying power as the models improve. So trying to do interaction design research around generative systems that will work even when we have GPT-7 and you know stable diffusion um, 15 because uh, if the models just keep improving and we have to keep redoing it, that's not as, that, I'm not sure if that's the best path forward for our, for our um, interaction design work. Got it, got it. Elena, let me ask you this question. What, what do you think the most exciting area to do research is gonna be next year? I think it's a little bit of a hard question, like in a sense that- That's why we hired you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean like in a certain sense, like what's personally exciting and what is exciting what the zeitgeist is in the field like these are two important things to keep in mind basically so mm -hmm. you know what i've been interested in has not changed all that much since since the zeitgeist was that MOOCs were going to kill universities right you know it's like <laughs> hmm. uh you know so so you obviously have to think about how the things you're interested in are relevant in like for the topic of the day but also like I, I i don't spend a lot of time thinking about what will be popular next year um mm -hmm. and so i i i will answer a different question i already answered a different question um <laughs> and i will just put a plus one next to what nick said about um you know when models capabilities are constantly changing right there's still a lot of work to be done that won't need to be redone, right? Because they they have to do with, say, human cognition, right? Humans aren't changing. <laughs> We're still the same wet chemistry, right? Um, and so no matter how much the model changes, what we are capable of consuming, what we're capable of reasoning about, how we can um, help ourselves reason better, right, stays the same. And so I, I don't know that that will be popular, but I would recommend that as a direction. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, Chidmay, let me toss this to you. What do you think? What are you going to recommend to your students to be working on the next year or two? Oh, so those are two separate questions. My students don't <laughs> necessarily <laughs> listen to me, which is a good thing. Uh, but I will say for the next year, I do think that there is, uh, I think that we will see a, uh, an explosion in the kinds and diversity in the types of models that people have available to them. Uh, and because there will be lots of moral capabilities, I think there will also be correspondingly lots of human needs that these models can meet. Uh, so I think that there will be essentially much more diversity in what people would do. Uh, I think one thing that I want to see, and hopefully will, uh, it seems like things are happening this way anyway, which is composability between these models and other parts of our technological infrastructure. Instead of having a uh, GPT-X system being sort of the, the central know-it-all of uh, the world, how does it play well with other systems? I think that would be uh, a useful thing to study how to do it well. Um, the two-year prediction, which I will give you for free, <laughs> is uh, I, I think that uh, right now I, I find this really strange that uh, most of the uh, viral uh, 
AI systems have a single player mode, right? So you talk to ChatGPT alone. You work with stable diffusion as one person. Uh, and I think that the really cool stuff is when multiple people work together. Uh, and I think that that would be an excellent sort of place for uh, AI to, to help. Uh, to Elena's point about, hey, humans have the same chemistry for years and years. Uh, we, we've not changed as a species, but we have changed as a species through culture. Right, so the culture of the 2020s is very different from the culture of the 1990s, uh, and I think that there could be a positive role for AI to play in that space, in that creating that culture. Fascinating, uh, Vera. Let's give you the last comment here. What would you say? I think I'm very much with Anina. I think one side is what you care about and the other side is you requires you make some prediction of the future how the world might change and the predicting the future is uh, is always hard um i think one thing of course um right now people talk a lot large language model generative model but besides this exciting capabilities um one nice thing about them is i feel they really lower the barrier for anyone to access AI capability and leverage the capability to use it for something else, right? You can use editors, you can do some fine tuning, context learning, and uh, further adapt it. Um, and I personally, I have always been interested in this space of uh, how do we support designers to work with AI? But there's also a question is how this lower access barrier change the landscape of who can be a designer, right? Uh, is it now every journalist, every writer can use GBT somehow for their own purpose, then they now they become a designer. I think there's an interesting research space of uh, how do we support everyone work as a designer to work with this kind of pre-trained model, maybe it's prototyping, uh, tool, maybe it's new design method, and also this question of uh, there is a, always this um, potential harms, right? How do we help people to anticipate, understand what is the harm specific to their contacts and come up with solution to, to mitigate that? And uh, I think a lot of opportunity are in this space of a uh, design solution, not necessarily uh, at a model end. So Very good. Uh, listening to both to, to everybody here, one of the things that strikes me is how much our culture is changing. So to echo Chinmay about that, it's uh, uh, this is such new, interesting material to work with, such new, low cost of entry, new capabilities that people can, you know, script kitties can now build the totally amazing things. And and so what does that do? That's an interesting question I think we, we need to answer is what happens when everybody can write a 500 page novel over the weekend? what does that do to the larger ecosystem of novels of books of music of videos of all of the stuff that's now synthesizable but my one year i'll say my two-year prediction would be more of a meta meta thing which is how do we understand how our evaluation functions change so for example uh does the, the, over the history of information retrieval the evaluation functions change as the technology got better and better, what the questions you would ask and the kinds of answers you, you would find acceptable and the metrics used would change. Are the metrics and the way we're evaluating chat GPT-3 or BARD or whatever going to work with BARD-29 or chat GPT-102? Or how will we have to rethink what it means to be able to evaluate these things? Elena, you've got a comment. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think evaluation is one of those topics that, you know, if you, if we have folks working on trying to evaluate systems regardless of, you know, what I mean, like coming up with um, version independent evaluation techniques. Absolutely. Really, really great uh, area. But I just just to, just to, I feel. Uh, a sense of responsibility to just mention that, you know, in response to both Chinmay and Dan, um, in terms of this notion of like, I, I think Chinmay, you, you expressed optimism that it will have a positive impact on us, you know, uh, culturally. And um, 
and and you know dan you're mentioning you, you could write a, a novel in a weekend um i think that uh we should be very careful about uh to heed folks i think i'm pretty sure the person who's been kind of uh leading this um has been um one of the professors who teaches the course on bullshit at washington right you yeah, know Jeff um carl bergstrom yeah uh these uh models are just you know when we talk about quality of output i'm not actually sure exactly what that metric of quality is but it's it's not so different than the quality of uh, it, you know they are very good bullshitters um they can't be very good bullshitters and i think that the you know we should also explicitly acknowledge that there are yeah huge downsides to that right i've heard them called cybernetic mansplainers which i think is a brilliant <laughs> <laughs> construction <laughs> yeah so yeah. Flooding, flooding the market with with 500 page books that were offered authored over the weekend right like right. that is exactly. a version that is a dystopian future potentially it, it is it is and um I, I don't know that we'll solve it by the time kai happens this year or maybe even kai next year uh but this is a great start to our conversation so i think what we'll do is we'll stop here and recognize that this is really a pause this is not a stop this is just the opening salvo of a much larger conversation that we'll be having uh because i'm really looking forward to actually meeting with all of you in hamburg and having our real in-person course and i hope all the students found at least some value in the answers that we gave in response to the questions you sent us so thank you for that